Welcome to today's webcast. This conference is being recorded. And now to begin the program, I would like to introduce Lee Pender. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to the webcast, Three Keys to Improving Security in Multi-Cloud Environments, sponsored by Rackspace. I'm Lee Pender with Virtualization Review Magazine. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to take care of a couple of housekeeping details. Please feel free to type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the left side of your console at any time during the presentation. We'll address as many of, our, of your questions as we can during the live event today. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties with the presentation, you may select the question mark icon at the bottom of your screen or ask for assistance through the question box. The entire webcast is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing. We'll send you an email when the replay is available. That's usually within 24 to 48 hours after the end of the webcast. And you can access the replay using the same link that you use today. Before we get started, let me take this opportunity to wish everybody a happy Veterans Day and to express our sincere thanks to all those who have served our country. We hope we have some veterans in the audience, and we'd like to thank you for your service. Uh, we have a great presentation for you today and several great, several great speakers here with us, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. Uh, Dan Kuznetsky is Chief Research Officer at uh, Kuznetsky Group, LLC. Dan has played many parts in the market for information technologies and has uh, helped guide several billion dollars of investment decisions. He's been a consultant, software engineer, a product manager, a product marketing manager, a marketing director, an industry analyst, a head of research operations, and is a well-known author and speaker. His research and uh, the resulting insight and opinion have been published in Computer World, in, uh, Internet World, ZDNet, CNET, BBC Online, CNN, MSNBC, and, and many other business and news publications. He's the author of the O'Reilly Media book, Virtualization, A Manager's Guide, and the author of the Making the IT Decisions series of e-books. Shantu Roy has been involved in the IT industry for over 20 years with a focus on the areas of software engineering, network security, application development, network design, systems design, virtualization, cloud design, uh, and he is currently the Chief Technology Officer for the VMware Cloud Practice at Rackspace. Uh, Jarrett Rame from Rackspace is also with us. He's the Head of Strategy and Operations for Managed Security there, and he is responsible for the development, implementation, and support of all customer-facing security products and services. Jarrett has served in several roles at Rackspace, including internal security architecture and product management. Uh, he was responsible for creating the Barbican Key Management product, uh, which is now part of the official OpenStack ecosystem, as well as building capabilities around Rackspace's efforts in the cryptographic engineering space, specifically around the PYCA cryptography. I don't know whether I said that right or not. <laughs> uh, PYCA cryptography library. Uh, Jared's background is in development, and he holds master's and bachelor's in computer science from Trinity and Lehigh Universities. And uh, we're very happy to have all three of these gentlemen with us today. And with that, Dan, I will turn things over to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction. Um, Jared, would you introduce yourself uh, in the area of what are you planning to talk about today? And then I'll ask Sean to the same question. Uh, sure, absolutely. So uh, today we're here to talk a little bit about security in the cloud space, right? So Rackspace Managed Security supports a wide variety of platforms from dedicated to private clouds to public clouds. Um, and so we have a lot of experience in thinking about how we apply security to those different platforms, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Sean, too, what uh, would you add to that? Yeah, and just uh, yeah, just uh, tagging on to what Jared said. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, secondly, so what we're going to talk about is mainly what we do around the uh, VMware space, um, specifically at, at Rackspace. And since we do a lot of our VMware offerings in a dedicated manner, I think this will kind of uh, you know talk about the journey to the cloud and you know, how security should be viewed in this journey. Great. Sounds like a really interesting session we're going to have here. So let's start. Jared, are you up first? Or? I am, yes. Just waiting for the slide to pop yeah, here. Here we you. go. All right. Excellent. So, um, so before we kind of get into the security side of things, we wanted to talk a little bit about what Rackspace is seeing in the cloud space, right? So, Certainly, we're seeing an increase in cloud adoption. I think everybody has seen that. Um, and it's driven by a lot of different factors, right? Some companies are trying to you know, get the dollar's value out of the scalability of public cloud. Some are trying to still move to virtualization. Some are trying to combine the different operations or the different uh, platforms to kind of solve problems that they have, um, and still doing a lot of work to do that. If you look at the, the kind of graph on the right, 
you're still seeing a lot of customers pretty widely spread between customers that are having a lot of success with the cloud, people that are still experimenting with it, um, all those different types of groups. And I think at Rackspace, what we see is a lot of larger customers really focusing on a hybrid cloud strategy, right? So this is not only using or going directly to public clouds like uh, Amazon and, um, and Azure and Rackspace, uh, but also using uh, private clouds as well as dedicated gear and combining all those platforms together to provide kind of a cohesive set of services for their internal folks. Right? So when we look at the barriers that we see to cloud adoption, right, we really see, uh, in general, a lot of concerns over security. Right? If you ask most, uh, if you look at most reports, security is the number one uh, challenge that customers are having in moving uh, different workloads to cloud. Right? So certainly that includes regulatory compliance, although it's becoming less and less of an issue over time as more and more cloud providers dig into that space. But loss of control, uh, staff expertise is a difficult problem, right? There are differences in the way that you approach a security platform when moving it onto the different cloud platforms and really getting that expertise that knows not only how to go about and do it from an architecture perspective, but how to strategically attack the problem. And then the operators, how do you actually deliver the service once you're on the platform? Uh, all of which feeds into budgetary constraints, right? Going out and hiring top flight people and retaining them is expensive. Uh, and the number of people that you need to add when you look at especially hybrid cloud strategies can get uh, very expensive for customers, right? Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of customers that are dealing with the typical uh, cloud adoption barriers around they already have large investments for data centers. Um, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of internal infrastructure built up around supporting those data centers. And so making the decision to move to someone else's data center or someone else's infrastructure is, uh, is challenging. Um, and so really it's, you know, the, the focus on the cloud piece for us is really a journey for most customers, right? And they move along a, a path from, you know, where they are in an internal DC or an operation center all the way up through public cloud. And it's never, the end result isn't just getting to public cloud, right? It's understanding the different platforms that you need to use for the different applications that you have in the different life cycles, right? And when we look specifically around the security threats that we're seeing in this space, right, there's been a lot of change uh, in 2014 and 2015 on the type of threat that we're seeing out there at Rackspace. So we split it into kind of two different groups, right? The first is what we call the background radiation of the Internet, right? And this is just bad people doing bad things. It's not targeted at a particular customer or a particular vertical. It's like spam. They just hit everybody, and some percentage of the time they're going to be successful. And so the goals of those particular types of attacks are the typical goals that you see and have seen for years in the security space, right? Uh, the denial of service attacks, criminal extortion around, hey, pay me money or I'm going to take your website down, right? But really in 2014 and, and 15, we've seen a dramatic increase in the so-called advanced persistent threat, right? I'm not wild about that term. It, 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 that term really used to mean state-sponsored activity. Um, now it's been kind of co-opted to mean any time a particular organization was, uh, was compromised. But when you look at APT, the key things that matter about it are that it's a, a well-motivated, well-funded, well-trained attacker, right? The, I, the days of kids in their basements doing this type of work probably were never really true, but are certainly not true when you're talking about this level of capability, right? And so combine that and that number of folks that have that type of capability coming out of the various uh, military and intelligence services, and you combine that with the, the massive weapons proliferation that we're seeing in the space, right? So for a small amount of money and really not that, that difficult, you can go out and buy advanced cyber weapons that are ready to go, right? You can plug them into your infrastructure and start attacking customers very quickly um, and have a high percentage chance of attack. And so because we're seeing this diversification in the threat landscape, it's not just uh, intelligence agencies and, and governments doing this work anymore. It's, you know, small groups that are part of, uh, organized crime or our hacktivist groups like uh, like Anonymous, um, now you're starting to see them really spread across the infrastructure, and you're, so you're seeing wildly different goals, right? So we've seen destruction uh, as a goal now. So in, when they went into uh, to Sony, for example, one of the goals was to convince Sony not to release uh, the particular movie, the interview, uh, but as part of that attack, they actually kind of salted the earth before they left. They really destroyed all of Sony's internal infrastructure. And so it, it caused an enormous amount of business damage. They were having to, you know, come out and print checks out, uh, which they haven't done for years and years, because that was the only way they could pay their suppliers and their people, because uh, their entire internal infrastructure was destroyed, right? And again, in the Sony attack, we saw that influencing business decisions capability, right? So now they're really trying to target the board and senior leadership of organizations to convince them to do something that the attacker wants, right? We saw a lot of press in the last couple of weeks around attackers that were using 
uh, cyber attack capabilities to perform kind of pump and dump and stock fraud schemes, right? So they would convince, they would buy a bunch of penny stocks and then use the cyber capability to go out and convince people to buy them and then they dump their, their versions of it. Or we saw one a couple of months ago where they compromised a company that does press releases so that they could get access to press releases before they were public and make trading decisions based on that. So you're really seeing a, a wide change here. And, you know, one of the big uh, trends that we saw in 2014 and 15 for Rackspace, we saw a lot of advanced threat actors going after our smaller customers. And when you dug into that, you saw what the FBI and others kind of pulled out in the long run was that that group was focused on stealing information from these smaller customers and then filing false tax returns, right? And so what that means is that while in the past, only our larger customers had to worry about these kind of more advanced style of attacks. Now we're seeing those attacks being leveraged across the entire infrastructure. They're much more prevalent. They're much cheaper to launch. Uh, and so because of that, we're seeing more and more of our customers uh, that kind of fall into this bucket. I'll let Sean to kind of take off talking a little bit about the, uh, the IT side of things here. Awesome. Great. Thank okay. you, Jared. So I was just going to say, Sean, too, that it sounds like internal IT has to walk a very fine line between uh, protecting their assets and making it so difficult that people don't want to work uh, in their IT environment. Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, how do you balance the needs of security and the needs of reliability and availability? Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the journey that we go with, through with our customers and look at, you know, especially with, you know, customers looking to move, you know, into uh, the cloud space where they're, you know, people see it as a destination, but we talk more mainly about the journey. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of times spend over scalability and, and performance metrics and, and, and availability, but a huge component of that is security. So, uh, you know, as we see, there, there's a little bit of a, of a, a dichotomy in, in viewing, you know, what the line of business is after their agility, their time to market, and the desire to go out there and get, you know, again, first to market. And then you have the uh, central IT, who is really the vanguards of security, reliability, uptime, and all the, the you know, things that surround a production environment, if you will. And so what, you know, I wouldn't, I guess my, you know, discussion wouldn't be complete if I didn't bring up the, the concepts and, and, and uh, a statement of shadow IT. And so what we're seeing generically is the lines of business are out there looking to become more agile and, you know, get to market quicker. But once that experiment, that proof of concept, you know, starts taking out revenue or what have you, all of a sudden the implications and the liabilities of having, you know, a, an environment out there that, that needs the, the protection and view of central IT becomes a reality. So the balancing act, you know, it makes it, I think, you know, incredibly hard on central IT to be able to deliver, uh, you know, security in a fashion that is easily consumable by the lines of business. Uh, but that's something we're going to talk about a little bit further is to there is a, a methodology and process that we can go through that allows still a, a degree of agility and speed, but uh, keeping it within, you know, constraints of having some secure essence behind it. Um, so to kind of, you know, uh, uh, tie on to that, you know, we look at uh, uh, security from uh, multiple assets. One is kind of the depth and offer, uh, offerings, if you will, you know, starting at uh, a simple workload all the way to the application information space and moving up the stack. And then we also see it, you know, depends on depth, if you will, from a delivery, from a user's uh, you know, perspective, all the way into the network operating system, the server of the network. So if you were to kind of map these two together, uh, this kind of, you know, lays out a, a, a graph, if you will, of as, you know, folks are moving from you know, traditional on-prem into kind of a hybridized environment, whether it's, you know, the final destination is the public cloud or something that is, you know, hybrid in nature, uh, you end up falling in one of these spaces. And I think currently understanding uh, what the security posture is, or what area should be focused on, uh, we believe that this, this map kind of allows you to say, you know, as you're moving closer and closer to the you know, cloud service provider, there are certain areas that you have to worry about uh, more critically. And there are other areas that you can really rely on the cloud service provider to bring to you. And, and as Jared mentioned, you know, giving our, our uh, space and, you know, having customers both, you know, in, you know, SMB, mid-market, and enterprise, we do see the variety of you know, great amount of attacks, and we do have the security, uh, uh, you know, products, you know, people, organizations in place that can help and take care of parts of these, 
you know, chunks as you see it. So it's really kind of a, a analog switch or analog dial in the digital world to be able to be smart and predictive on the slow movement from on-prem onto the cloud and, and, and the journey thereof. Um, so moving on to just talking a little bit more about the journey. Sorry, Dan, you had a question. I was just going to say um, the journey is really interesting. What tools and thought processes do you think are really important for people to have or to hold on to while they're making this journey? No, that's a great question. I have one more slide that's following this that really kind of talks about the approach. And the, the approach is very similar to having, you know, the, the, the capabilities around uh, physical security. Like, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. It's just the, the attacks, the compromises are definitely become more complex in nature, but it's also fended off by some fundamentals. And I think what happens uh, in that balancing act, if you will, is as lines of business kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, look flexibility or, or turn a blind eye to be even able to bring a product to market much quicker and faster. There's some some understandings or, or areas that are not focused on as much, which result in potential problems down the road. So the the advice, and we'll see in, in the following slide, is to take a very encapsulated and very methodical approach to saying, you know, the application starts all the way from the physical essence all the way up into the application stack itself. You know, and it's 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 all the way from secure coding methodologies, um, protecting your code, and all the way into saying you know, restrict access to certain environments. So you know, just going back to the slide at hand here, um, those methodologies, regardless of where you are in the journey, should apply. So even if you're at the point of just virtualizing and going through the server consolidation phase, um, or you're into the you know the private cloud. Uh, section of it where you are wanting cloud-like attributes to your virtualization environment where you have some elasticity, you have the ability to kind of carve out your virtualization space to be focused on specific applications or even as an extent of having kind of a CI CD model where you're, it's part of your workflow of releasing uh, uh, you know, versions of your application, all going to the hybrid cloud where certain parts of your workloads do live in uh, the public cloud. Some live in the private cloud and some still live in on-prem and then the transition between. The, the thing to remember is, regardless of where these workloads end up, if there's a good security posture and good security practices put in place, um, as you move up and into a more kind of a wider environment, do you have people that are along the journey? So Central IT looks to move these workloads. The cloud service providers can help augment some of those areas, uh, that which, uh, which does not allow in any lack of security, but actually increases the uh, with the different offerings that you can find in, in the, uh, the space as a whole. So from a tooling perspective, you know, it's, I'm specific, specifically about the VMware solutions, you have an extremely big VMware ecosystem with a lot of security tools and uh, um, know, components out there that rely all the way down into the security of the VM itself, into the hypervisor, and also joining networks. You can look at uh, technologies that VMware has, like NSX, uh, uh, that, you know, what we have, you know, available in our environments all the way into having just VM containerized approaches as well. So those tools exist. I think in the next slide you'll see it's about how to apply them into your environment to make sure that you uh, retain that level of security. So uh, moving on, on to the, uh, you know, defense, defense in depth, if you will, by just looking at the different components. So the application protection you know, vulnerability assessments, being able to do penetration testing to be able to actually validate that you don't have errant passwords in your code that could be potentially compromised. And going into also the behavioral monitoring, like once the data is out there, once the data is available, how are the systems acting, how are they behaving? And in each of these layers, there are security practices we put around them that allow for that de defense to be done in smaller components but not lose any any uh, capabilities inside just security as a whole through the whole stack. So this, again, goes down to having, um, you know, file integrity, you know, application control, uh, good uh, um, uh, change of management in place to make sure that the production versions of your code base goes through a right change management. There are multiple eyes looking at it. So, again, the, the theory here is that there's nothing, you know, widely new. It's just that attacks are getting significantly more complex. And they're also, now you're talking about the attacks that are hitting distributed work environments or workloads, if you will. Um, so being able to apply good security policies and, and the controls 
down to the singular or the building blocks, if you will, is really what's going to help you through this transition. Um, that I'll turn it over back to uh, Jared. All right. I'm sorry, Jared. Um, can you talk a little bit about how do you deal with these threats as they become more complex and more, uh, I'll use the word, advanced? Sure. So uh, typically there are a couple of different plans that we have for going out and doing this, right? So um, when we look at how we build out a protection platform against these types of advanced threats, it comes down to a couple of things. First, you need to have uh, a set of tooling in place that really gives you visibility into the environment, right? So uh, at Rackspace in general in the community, we call this the triple stack, right? And so it's a host protection platform, a network protection platform. Uh, both of those surface what we call security analytics, right, or just security data about the environment up to the analytics platform, right? And this can include your traditional SIM, uh, security information events, uh, or it can include a lot of these new bigger data approaches, right? Um, and so at Rackspace, we actually deploy both because I think there's value in both platforms at the moment. The big data stuff hasn't quite gotten to the point where it can uh, stand on its own. Um, but that allows you to really make sense of all of this data that you're getting in the environment. Because the trick is we, we're moving away from the signature-based style of doing things, right? So when you look at those two different types of threats, that background radiation threat versus the APT threat, background radiation can still be opposed by tools, right? Tools are still effective at it. Now you have to get the intelligence into the tools much faster than you used to, right? So you used to be able to see an attack hit full disclosure or a vulnerability hit full disclosure, and it wouldn't be weaponized for quite a bit of time. Now you can see those things get weaponized and they start spinning across the infrastructure you know, within hours. And so being able to have this fully automated kind of tactical threat intelligence that you're getting from all of your partners and pushing it down into your tools is incredibly important, right? So Rackspace is built uh, an information sharing capability with other cloud providers like Microsoft and Amazon and Google and those guys um, to share data about what we see across our infrastructure and what they see across their infrastructure in an anonymized way so we can get that, that threat protection down in those tools. But at the end of the day, the tools are not effective at protecting against an APT-style threat, right? And so to really protect against those types of threats, you need to focus on getting actionable strategic intelligence. Right, so this is really understanding who the threat actors are in the space um, and what, they're gonna, what weapons they're going to bring to the fight. Right? So we all know that we can spend an unlimited amount of money on security. Right? There's a million threats. There's a ton of different threat vectors and threat models that you can try to address. But if you have a strong understanding of what threats you're actually going to see, what are the bad guys going to try to do to you, right? then you can focus your money on the things that have the best bang for the buck. Right? So when you go to build this threat platform, you have to really get visibility on all levels of the stack. Right? And so that means that when you look at the different infrastructures that you're providing, how you get visibility into those infrastructures really kind of dictates or changes based on what infrastructure you're trying to talk about. Right? So getting network visibility in a dedicated environment where I can just pull a span tap off a switch and get full visibility into the traffic is very different from doing that on AWS, for example. Uh, or if you do it on a VMware infrastructure, tools that can plug into the VMware networking components that make up the private cloud Right, are pretty prevalent today. Right? So you would want to deploy those because they fit best with the platform that you're trying to move it to. Right? So that's what you need to really defend against that type of APT threat. Right? The only way to defend against a well-motivated, well-funded, well-trained attacker is a well-motivated, well-trained defense team. And you can see this in the way that we defend military installations today. Right? We don't build 100-foot capital walls around military bases anymore. You have a fence. Right? You want to do some deterrence. You want to try to keep the, the less qualified or you know, looky-loos away from your environment. So you want to do deterrence. But what's actually protecting you is that fast response team, right? that detection and response capability. And that's really what you're building with advanced threat protection. Right? So if you assume that your environment will get breached, and that's a good assumption, the security community has moved away from talking about prevention, right? then you need to go and make sure that your money is being spent on detecting when an attacker breaches your perimeter and when you can, and getting them out before they can do any damage, right? And that's really what uh, the kind of advanced threat piece is all about, right? Um, so when we look at how we go about uh, doing those types of things, you have to go build the threat protection piece, and that includes your analysts and your intelligence and the, and the triple stack. And that's really about that detect and response offer. Um, but in addition to that, we really need to get into um, kind of that host and network protection piece. So pulling all this data from your different platforms, right? And Rackspace uses a wide variety of partners that are out there in the space. There are lots of good options for folks to kind of decide on to fit your environment. 
And you need to be able to install those tools and pull that visibility back to your analysts. Because at the end of the day, the tools won't save you, right? Tools are a part of the solution, but they're not capable of detecting all of the advanced persistent threat type of work that you're going to see. So not only do you, does your SOC need to have a mission of responding to alerts, right? Yes, my tool saw something and I need to go investigate it, right? And those alerts are becoming grayer over time, right? So as we move into things like behavioral analytics, we're seeing an alert based on, hey, this looks funny. I don't know that this server is compromised. I didn't see the compromise, but I, do care. I need to go look and see why it's behaving weirdly. So a good example of this is when we see something like uh, an attacker get access to a username and password. Right, so they go and log into a server. So far, no problem. Right? You're not going to see anything on your tooling. Your log management looks fine. Right? Everything looks fine because it's a, a, officially a user who has access to the server is logged into it. And then let's say they start pulling data out of a database. Well, that's a little weird, but could easily be a, an administrator doing work, backing up the database, whatever it is that they happen to be. But then you see them compress that into an encrypted RAR file. Right? So that's a pretty common tactic for attackers who are about to exfil data. And so all of a sudden, your tools are going to light off and you need your, uh, your analyst to go and evaluate that kind of gray alert and go figure out whether it's the real thing. But in addition to that, if you assume that attackers and the tooling won't detect them in every case, then what your, your SOC needs to do is have a dual mission. Right? They've got to do that, that responding to alerts piece, but they also have to be proactive about how we go into the environment and find attackers. Right? We call this process cyber hunting. At the end of the day, what you're doing is you're taking that strategic intelligence that you've gotten uh, about what APT threat actors are doing, and then you're going to go look for them. Right? You don't have a reason. You don't have an alert that you're following up, but you look at, at what they're doing and you make a guess. Right? So a good example would be a, a threat actor recently has transitioned a lot of their, uh, their tooling to using Tor for network communication. Well, in some cases, you'll see an alert if somebody uses Tor traffic in an environment, but for a lot of customers, you won't. Right? They'll have outbound access to the Internet is not that restricted. And so Tor traffic, it just looks like regular traffic, and you don't get an alert. So instead, what we'll say is, who is this threat actor going after? Let's say they're going after uh, Pfizer, financial services. Right? So then we'll take our customers who are in the financial services group, and we'll go into their environments proactively and look for evidence of Tor. Right? And that can be Tor traffic, or that can be files that are used to communicate with the Tor network. And that will give us evidence that that, uh, that, that attacker is in the environment. Right? So that's really the detect and response piece. Right? If you've got a buck to spend on security, you spend 95 cents of it on detect and response because that's what you can guarantee you're going to need, right? Because you can't keep them out, right? And while we can't really prevent attacks, what we can do is deter them, right? And so when we look at the deterrence aspect of things, what you're really doing is hardening in the environment. You're making it more expensive for an attacker to operate in your space. And if you're lucky, that means they'll go pick on the next guy, right? But if you're not lucky and they're still going to come after you, it slows them down, right? So that deterrence element is really about slowing the attacker's ability to move through your infrastructure so that your detect and response offer can find them and kick them out before they do any damage, right? And a key component of that is around kind of the vulnerability management piece of things, right? So making sure that uh, your hosts are hardened and monitored, right, um, that you've configured them correctly and locked them down, making sure that you're up to date on your patches and you understand what vulnerabilities are available in your environment and you've mitigated the ones that make sense, understanding what users are touching your servers and when they're touching it, and then finally, what, you know, detecting changes that are made to files, all very good options on the deterrent side of the house. It also turns out that having a good deterrence platform also checks a good amount of boxes on the compliance bucket. Right? And we know with all the attacks of the last couple of years, the government has to look like they're doing something. And this is worldwide, not just the U.S. government. They're going to have to look like they're doing things. And the only lever that they have to pull is the compliance lever, and they're going to yank that lever a whole bunch. Right? So we're going to see more and more compliance regimes falling, uh, our, falling for our customers. They're going to be wider. They're going to be harder to deal with. Um, and so having a really good deterrence platform not only delivers really strong capabilities around security and really makes your detection response offer more effective, also solves a lot of the compliance issues that you may have in your environment. Right? So uh, when we look at uh, kind of the, the threat analytics piece, uh, really what we're looking at here is making sense of all the data that you get in your environment, right? So when you start putting these host-based tools that are agents on boxes and network-based tools that can pull NetFlow and metadata and selected PCAP and all those things, your analyst team is going to be overwhelmed with the amount of data that they have, right? If they had to chew through all that data by hand, they're never going to find anything. Looking for a needle in a stack of needles, it's tough, right? And so the analytics piece is all about making them more effective consuming that data, putting those expertise-based eyes in the places that they need to be at the time that they need to be in, 
Um, so that's typically done by a SIM, right? Um, there's a lot of research going on the big data side. SIM, to be effective right now, throws away an enormous amount of data. And so that really is kind of the antithesis of the big data approach, right? On the big data side, you really want to keep all of that data that you have because it might be useful at some point, right? And so uh, you'll see a coming together of those platforms probably over the next 12 months would be my guess in that SIM will take over this idea of being a big data security tool. Uh, and that's a, a, an incredible, incredibly important piece of things because that's how you scale your analyst group, right? So this is critical at Rackspace. I have a, an analyst team that has to support hundreds and thousands of customers as we grow, right? But even if you're a small organization building your own security information center or a large organization trying to make your security information center scale, right, then having those tools means that you're spending less analyst time on doing things that can be automated, right? And then, of course, all of this really depends on having strong threat intelligence data. Right. Uh, right now, there's a lot of companies selling threat intelligence. I think over the next 12 to 18 months, you'll see that start to fall away. The value of all of us sharing this data is higher than the revenue that we can drive from selling it. Right. That being said, if you're out buying security products, right, one of the things that you should be looking at with security products is what type of threat intel they're doing. Are they updating these things with signatures? How often are they doing it? Right. Is it real time or do I have to wait 24 hours when an attack comes around? Right? Can I put my own signatures in the platform? So if I know that there's a vulnerability out there that I can't patch right away, then maybe I can use my tooling as a, a, a lever to be able to protect against that. Right? And so that tactical intelligence needs to be fully automated. It needs to be real time. Right? It needs to get to the point where our detection platforms are understanding these vulnerabilities and getting them pushed out and protecting our infrastructures you know, in the seconds to minutes time frame. Right? That's where we need to get. Right? But we also really need access to that strategic intelligence. And this one's a lot harder to do. You can't just go out and buy good strategic intelligence in general. You got to go out and, and pull it and glean it from all of the other data that's, that's out there in the space. But that tells you who the threat actors are and what they're going to do, right? And so not only do you need to know that to really develop the right tools that you need to have in your environment, but it's incredibly important from a strategic perspective. If you're a CSO and you're trying to design a protection platform, you need to know where you need to focus your dollars, right? And strategic intelligence can really tell you that. So partnering with large providers, Rackspace is one. There are several others in the space that will help, under, help customers understand the strategic threats to their business is incredibly important in being able to understand where you need to spend your dollars and where your threats are, are actually coming. And of course, then you need an operational team to be able to protect against those threats. And that's where the Security Operations Center and, and those types of groups come in. I'll hand it over here to talk a little bit more about the VMware side of things. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Um, uh, Shantu, could you go into a little bit of description of the VMware portfolio you're working with and Rackspace's offerings? Because I think that would be really interesting to the audience. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so if you look at the three offerings that we have here, um, all of them are built on the frameworks and concepts that Jared was talking about you know, from a security perspective at least. But then you also have the whole operations team that can help you manage and maintain your environments as you move forward. So as you look at the journey between you know, going from on-prem into a hybrid state or into the public state, this is kind of covers the, the middle ground, the, the private cloud ground, if you will. So we have server virtualization that's been around for about 10 years now, um, is a fully managed kind of a white glove uh, um, an approach to it where we do management, monitoring, security all the way from the guest OS um, into the infrastructure and the whole nine yards. So what you get is a whole operations team that is after managing and maintaining your virtualized infrastructure all the way into the guest OS itself. So um, this allows you the full flexibility and focus on the application and your workloads, but leaving the operational and security maintenance and what have you onto Rackspace. So taking a step further from that um, is uh, another dedicated uh, VMware vCenter offering. And so what we have in the vCenter offering is uh, the same level and the same frameworks and constructs to help support the virtualization stack, but giving you the flexibility to consume the APIs, the UIs that are native to VMware and let you manage and maintain your workloads. But the benefit to that is we still have VMware technologies and the ecosystem that are available to not only just uh, you know, address any of the prevention side of things, but to actually uh, you know, integrate to all the newer and advanced technologies you know, and security that are available to make uh, you not, to give centralized still the ability to control and manage and maintain their workloads, but the underlying substructure 
the virtualization substructure is still managed and maintained by uh, Rackspace that gives you the ability that, you know, even if your, uh, uh, you know, focus of security is into the VM itself, if anything outside and above and beyond that is maintained by Rackspace. Um, and so same applies with uh, the vCloud Director, uh, which is the next offering. But as you know, vCloud Director is also gives more of a, um, you know, cloud-like experience into dedicated infrastructure, if you will. So if you're at that stage where you need more cloud-like elasticity, being able to kind of carve out dedicated organizations and what have you, but still have the flexibility of moving workloads in and out. Um, so we kind of, you know, use these two environments as kind of a step behind, kind of step out of your way, but we uh, have the watchful eye and vanguards into, uh, uh, you know, helping you maintain and manage security, operational uptime, and all the things that you need an operations and security team to do. So those are kind of the three uh, environments uh, and offerings that we have at Rackspace, and then fits very nicely into that middle section of, uh, you know, you coming out of pure virtualization, entering the IT as a service uh, model at the end, but going to the steps of, you know, IaaS and even potentially PaaS or even, you know, cloud service is that these offerings kind of, you know, stair step you through it. You know, I'll hand that back to uh, Jared. All right. So, Chair, uh, please go ahead, Jared. I'd love to hear more about uh, what uh, Rackspace is doing to help people manage security and compliance in their environment. Sure. So, um, as we really kind of uh, went to market with these new offers for us, uh, which is the Managed Security and Compliance Systems offer, right? They map down to our opinions about what customers should be doing in their environments, as you would expect, right? So the managed security offer is really that detect and response offer, right? It's the, it's the triple stack. It's host-based protection, network-based protection, security analytics, vulnerability management, log management, all those capabilities, um, and all backed by our 24-7 security operations center uh, that we've built out uh, at the castle, which is our, our home base here in San Antonio. Right. In addition to that, we have that deterrence offer, right? And because deterrence really checks a lot of compliance boxes, we wrapped it up as a compliance package, right? So you get the deterrence capability in that we're going through and hardening that environment and making sure that that environment is inhospitable to attackers, right? And, but you also get to go through that and use that to check off all the boxes that you need to check off from a, a security perspective, right? Both of those offers leverage uh, Rackspace's security expertise, right? Rackspace can go out and hire these folks because they can spread the cost around a large variety of customers. But in reality, a lot of these guys want to come work at Rack, right? If you spend all of your life in the information security business, you want to be in the fight. Um, and with 300,000 customers across you know, the entire world, Rackspace sees a lot of fights. Uh, and so we're able to kind of give them an opportunity to really operate at the best of their capability and challenge them and let them continue to learn. And so we get a lot of folks that want to come and, and operate in that space, right? And, you know, Rackspace, at the end of the day, we're not a, a tool company. We don't have a tool to sell. Um, we're a service company, right? I don't want to be the arms dealer. I want to be the army. And so we go out in the space, and when we looked at our customer base, we noticed that they were having an incredibly hard time keeping up with the change in the security space. There's been so much investment from the VC perspective in the last couple of years that there are just hundreds of security providers out there, all promising to protect you against everything. And so to go through and figure out what every single one of those providers does, how it actually works under the covers, whether it applies to your particular platform, test it on you know, the uh, server virtualization powered by VMware offer that we have, or uh, the dedicated vCenter offer to make sure that'll work when you need to be able to, to move to that offer in the future was really prohibitively expensive for a lot of our customers. It just took too much time. So Rackspace is opinionated about the tools that we bring to the fight, right? And that gives us a couple of really great benefits. One, I need fewer rackers, right? So I only have to be experts in the weapons that I choose to use. I don't have to be experts in everything, right? And that means that I, ha I need fewer rackers on staff to do that. In addition, it really makes my automation a lot more effective, right? When I have my dev team only has to deal with a subset of the tooling rather than anything that we could see in the space, right, then that lowers or that makes it more effective on what we can do from an autom automation perspective. So both of those things really combine to a lower total cost of ownership for us, right? Good security is never cheap, right? It costs money to deliver these type of capabilities, and the expertise base, uh, these, these folks are in demand, right? So there's definitely cost there. But because we are opinionated about the tools that we bring, that allows us to be effective about delivering really high value for the dollars that, uh, that the customer is putting into the environment. Right, so finally to kind of wrap things up on the, the, before we take questions here. So when we look at security in the cloud, 
the, the thing to remember is a lot of customers will come and say, hey, the cloud is fundamentally less secure than dedicated. Um, and that's really just not true, right? Every single platform that you deploy on has a different way that you need to think about security, right? There are commonalities across all of them, to be sure, right? Uh, but when you look at those, not, no, no particular platform is more secure or less secure than any other. It's just how you go about providing that security, right? So one of the dangers that we see a lot of customers stumble into is trying to, you know, so-called forklift their, their, their environment. So they're taking an a environment that they have inside their data center and trying to just move it directly to the cloud, whether that's a private cloud or a public cloud, right? And by doing that, you're trying to replicate everything that you did uh, before, and that's fundamentally a difficult process. So you'll run into a lot of areas where what you used to do won't work very well or will be prohibitively expensive or will cause gymnastics in your application architecture. So in reality, it's better to really think about how do I use the new platform effectively and what does it offer me from a security perspective and what new tools and threats do I have and what old threats do I have that I don't have anymore and then design for that. Right, so security should be an input into the platform selection process, but shouldn't be the deciding factor, right? We shouldn't be deciding, hey, I'm gonna keep this application on dedicated because it's too sensitive to move anywhere else, right? It's all about protecting the data that you have in the application and enabling the business to do its work, right? So at the end of the day, that means that tools are really only part of the picture, right? So because you're gonna end up using a variety of platforms to meet the business goals, right? You're gonna need a bunch of different tools to provide you visibility and do all that type of work, but in reality, what makes those tools effective are the expertise-based people behind the screens, right? They're the ones that are going to actually go out and do this work and secure the environment. A tool is very capable of protecting against certain types of threat, and it's just not ever going to be capable of protecting against other types of threats, right? So you need to have both the service capability and the tool capability. Um, and a mistake that we've seen a lot of our, our customers make over time is to, to take someone uh, in the operations organization, the IT organization, uh, who used to, you know, take care of databases and say, hey, I bought the security tool, you're going to monitor it now, right? And while you can get a lot of value out of those folks and they do a yeoman's job at, at protecting these types of environments, there is really no substitute for 10 years of cyber warfare experience that you get out of something coming, coming out of the cyber warfare center, right, um, here in San Antonio. We actually get a lot of those folks that come over. So, you know, really the, the people piece is – to be honest, more important than the tooling, great people can make use of, of a lesser set of tooling uh, than, you know, that they don't need the necessarily the, the best of breed, although if you can arm them with both, you can get better results, right? And so it really comes down to as a security company, as a security organization, right, we have to focus on the fact that we're not securing environments for the sake of securing environments. Our goal is to not provide security. Our goal is to enable the business to solve the problem that they have. Right? And if that's moving to a new platform to get better costs or get better uh, operational tempo and delivering feature to customers or scale better or whatever the problem that they're trying to solve is, that's what we have to do. Security has always been an inhibitor in a lot of those cases, and we need to move to being an enabler. So it's our job to understand how we work with a platform that the customer has chosen to provide the security that is required. Right? Now, it's never 100%. Right? There are some times when you're going to have to say, hey, look, we just can't do what you want to do right now. But for the most part, when you look across all those different platforms that customers want to consume, we can provide solid protections across all of them. So the goal there really is to make sure that as a security group, we're sitting down and saying, great, this is your goal from a business perspective. Let's figure out how to get there, right? And a lot of that is stuff that you can get from Rackspace, right? There are other providers in the space as well, but, you know, Rackspace has a huge footprint uh, globally, lots of customers. You know, we run our own data centers. Uh, we also now support AWS, and we support Azure, and we support uh, things in customer data centers, like putting private clouds on gear that customers own. So we have a pretty wide experience across that entire gamut of what customers are trying to do in the IT and cloud spaces, right? That journey that we talked about from, you know, my managed colo or, or on-prem environments all the way up to everything running on pure public cloud and scaling up and down and all those types of things. We have experience in all those spaces on the best types of platforms. Right? So when we're talking about, hey, you need to think about this, and you need to think about that, and you need to make sure you're doing this, right? for a lot of customers, it's really difficult to do that in-house. And that's when you want to reach out to a managed service provider if it makes sense, and that provider can kind of help you solve a lot of those problems. That's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis at Rackspace. That's what, we, that's what we sell. We're a fanatical support company. I think that is the end of our prepared content, so I think we can take questions now. Let me... Um uh, read the, the first question that someone has posed. 
uh, and I think this might be addressed to you, Jared. Uh, doesn't cloud increase the security exposure to threats uh, when you compare it to using your own on-site or on-premise environment? So as we mentioned before, I don't believe that public cloud or private cloud or any environment is inherently more or less secure. There are just different threats that you have to worry about. Right? So when you look at public cloud, for example, and you start thinking about the shared hypervisor model, now all of a sudden you have to worry about a hypervisor compromise as a threat. Right? That's a threat you don't have in the dedicated and private cloud space. Now there are ways you can mitigate that. Right? There are also applications for which that might be an acceptable risk. Right? So deciding, hey, look, the value that I get out of public cloud outweighs the risk I'm taking in this particular threat model, you can do that. And if it's not something that you're willing to take the risk on, or if we don't have the capability or the money to go and, and mitigate that risk, then it may make sense to look at a different platform and say, hey, look, I'm going to take a different set of expenses to go use a private cloud or go use a dedicated environment because I need this capability. I think you're also seeing cloud providers starting to move to addressing some of this, right? So uh, at Rackspace, we have a product called OnMetal that is an entirely cloud-based product, right? It's API-driven, it's usage-based, it's you know, spin up, spin down, you get infrastructure in a minute, all those things that we expect from infrastructure, but instead of a virtual machine, you get a physical machine, right? So that allows you to not worry about that particular threat that you cared about, right? So certainly it is different in how you go about protecting cloud systems, right? But when you start looking at very large enterprises, Google's and Netflix and Facebook and all these guys, they're running all of their infrastructure on top of these types of platforms, right? It can be done. Right? But you'll have to kind of marry that with what capability do you have internally, what type of resources do you want, what type of provider are you going to work with, and can that provider solve the problem to the dimension that you want to go. So I think it's too easy to say that a particular organ or a particular platform is, is secure or not secure. It really comes down to every platform has different threats that apply to it, right? and you have to think about how your application will deal with those threats and which ones are acceptable and not acceptable. Thanks very much, Jared. Shantu, there's a question that looks like it's aimed at you. Uh, are you seeing certain industries or vertical markets that are moving in the direction of cloud or IT as a service more quickly than others? Yeah, it's, I think that's a great question. So w what we're seeing is um, it always comes down to and always driven by the application stack itself of what is the desire to move. As we all know, there's always constraints in the IT budgets, and you know, and, and everyone's uh, budget is always being squeezed and pushed. Uh, the question is, and the desire to move to the cloud is is a standard, I think, ask between any enterprise or mid market or even SMB for that matter. Uh, so the specific market that we see is the the folks that don't have a lot of compliance or revenue generation tied right in, you know into their application stack. We see those guys to be the first few uh, that can you know adapt uh, the cloud technologies. Also, for the ones that are not having to worry about legacy systems, they can start net new. They can start building for the cloud and use really distributed uh, architectures and models into their new application stack. But what we're seeing a bigger uptrend and move on is existing central IT trying to move and get out of maintaining and managing everything themselves, just to what Jared mentioned a, a few minutes ago. It's kind of you know, the awareness and the expertise that we bring to the table allows for the journey to take place. They're not kind of twisting in the wind if they go 100% in you know, a public cloud and then left with how do I how do I operationalize this? How do I support it? How do I make sure that we still have availability and you know all the requirements in the production environment? But this is where I think partnering with you know uh, different cloud providers, if you will, as in, you know, in specific as well, we're very used to doing. They've been doing it for about 10 years. So just to kind of for the sake of metrics. Uh, you know, for like our server virtualization environment, we have close to 70,000 VMs and about 12, I think 13, almost 13,000 hypervisors that are under maintenance. So we do this, and we see different, you know, uh, industries moving at a different pace. But there's definitely an uptake in in the desire to kind of, you know, enter the private cloud market. Very interesting, uh, Jared. I have a question here that I think fits fits you, and that is to could you expand a little bit on how to leverage behavioral analytics to improve security? Yeah, it's a good question and it's a deep topic, to be honest. I think you know, a lot of tools that we have in the space now are based on signature type things, right? So if I see this type of traffic or if I see this file or if I see these contents, 
right? Then I'm going to throw an alert or I'm going to block it or I'm going to do those things, right? So the problem is that most APT style attackers uh, won't fall into that camp, right? So while they may go buy a particular type of uh, vulnerability or a particular type of weapon, right, they're going to tune that weapon to themselves. So we see this at Rackspace all the time where an attacker will hit us, we'll block that attack, and then 15 minutes later, they've recompiled that attack and sent it back to us again. So the attack looks different, but it's still the same attack. And the fact is that when you get down and you really just accept the fact that the perimeter is no longer a thing that you can defend, right, you can't keep attackers out of that, right, then some parts of your infrastructure will get compromised over time. And if you're assuming an APT-style attacker, then you won't see it coming, right? You won't see an attack that's going to hit you. You won't see a file that you recognize as being malicious. Um, and of course, you know, 75% of the major attacks in 2014 and 2015 on the APT style started with a spear phish of a particular user that got the attacker credentials, and those credentials were used across the space. So behavioral analytics is a way to take telemetry data that we're seeing, right? So this is every file that's accessed, every process that's launched, right? Even down to sometimes the memory locations that are being accessed by particular processes on a host and surface all that data. That's way too much data for a user to consume. So you push that through your analytics capability looking for behavior that indicates that a server is compromised, right? So you don't know that it was compromised. You don't know how it got to that state, but it's looking like it's doing something that's just a little weird. Right? It's something that's possibly or has been attributed to an attacker. And that's really where that threat intelligence comes in, is you look and you say, well, what behaviors have attackers exhibited? Right? And then I can start to put that into the behavioral analytics tools to alert me when it sees that, that type of traffic. So behavior analytics is a way to detect an APT-style attack by looking at what the attacker is going to have to do with your host to be successful at achieving their goal, right? even if you can't detect the method by which they come. That's fascinating. Uh, another question for you, Jared, that I think is related to the first one, or the one you just answered. Uh, we're seeing the threat environment, the security environment change. What do you think we're going to see in the future for different tools, or are we going to see more of a, a managed service provider type of role required? Tell me what you think about you. that, please. It's a good question, right? A little bit of uh, prognostication here. So certainly I think in the short term, the next you know, 12 to 24 months, we're going to see a collapsing down to managed service providers in security because there just aren't enough people to do this, right? If you have to build a 24-7 security operations center, you're in it for 3 to $5 million to start, and most of that's people, so you're going to keep paying it, right? And most of our customers can't afford that kind of investment. Very few companies actually can. And add on to the fact that these people just don't exist, right? So Microsoft did a study in 2014 that said that there were 1 million InfoSec jobs that went unfilled. We just don't have the bodies, right? And couple that with the fact that information security is generally not core competency or core to the offer of any particular company. It's a business enabler, right? Then it's a very good opportunity for them to be able to outsource some of this work to a managed security provider that's going to come in and, and help them do that, right? Um, and I think from the... The tools perspective, we're going to see a, a huge move, and it's already happening. It's going to continue to accelerate to the big data and analytics side of things, right? So signatures don't work. We know that. They're a good tool, right? They protect against a certain type of threat, and it certainly makes it more, it makes it harder on the attacker uh, over time. But, you know, being able to detect the types of things that, you know, make an attack make sense, right, or that an attacker is going to have to do in your environment is going to be, become pretty valuable. I think we're also going to see an, an increase in more and more companies relying on intelligence, right? We're seeing a big boom in small intelligence companies now. Those small intelligence companies are probably going to consolidate a bit, and we're going to have some big ones that are going to be able to start to provide this type of visibility, right? Uh, and then finally, a lot of this and a lot of the dollars are going to be driven by compliance changes, right? So governments are going to have to respond to the fact that many, many, many companies are getting compromised, sometimes from threat actors that are other governments, right? So Certainly the Russians and the Chinese, the Iranians, uh, the Syrians before that place kind of turned into a mess, uh, all had really strong cyber programs. And they're stealing intellectual property and they're you know, infiltrating environments kind of willy-nilly at this point. And so you know, you're seeing that being addressed at a very high level from a governmental perspective. You know, at the end of the day, the government's going to have to pull some levers to kind of force organizations to invest here. Right? And so getting out ahead of the curve can certainly provide a lot of value for you. 
in that you're not going to then be forced under an audit to go and do some of these types of things. You can kind of attack it at your own, at your own speed. Fantastic. I think we have time just for one final question that just came in. And I'm not sure who would be best to address this. I'll just read the question and let you figure out which, which person should address it. What's a typical or common set of mistakes that corporations make during the selection of cloud security models? Well, that's a good one. Uh, maybe I'll start, and, and Shantu can kind of kick in uh, after here, because I, I bet you he has an opinion on it as well. I think I talked a little bit about one that I see, which is forklifting, right? Really trying to take what you do today in your environment and try to just make it work on the next environment. Uh, that's really hard, right? Square peg, round hole. You've got to spend a lot of time and energy trying to do that. Um, the challenge for a lot of customers is that they've already made big investments with tool vendors. They're locked into long-term contracts. Um, and so that can make that you know, a really difficult place to be in, right? And that's where a managed service provider can really help you in that I have a lot more flexibility in, um, in how I contract. I think the second biggest one for me is really take, expecting that an application won't have to change on a move, right? So in a lot of cases, if you want to take an application that's been running undedicated and was developed undedicated, and now you want to run it on public cloud, that's going to be a, a, a journey that's going to take some time, and it's going to involve development, and it's going to involve really change inside the organization and all those different types of things to be able to get where you want to go. It's very difficult, and we've seen a lot of customers have a real trouble with taking their, hey, I have this app, and it has nine servers, and so I'm going to spin nine servers in AWS, and I'm going to move my app up there um, and have it really be difficult for them to do that. Right? So um, I'll pass it off to Sean, too. I'm sure he has some, some of his own observations that he's made from his group. No, absolutely right, and Jared. I think the eyes wide open approach is, is the best. Um, you know, common mistakes that we see is typically, uh, you know, as a, a application stack moves environment, the expectation that nothing changes is usually the wrong expectation, both from not only just an analytical model of where's your data ending up, what are you doing with the data. The metrics have changed, the dynamics have changed. So we always say, you know, take the eyes wide open approach to see where does your data end up, what's happening to the transaction on transient data, what's happening to the persistent data. Whereas, so th those conversations really don't take place in the dedicated environment when, when you go to distribute your workload or you move it to, you know, to quote unquote cloudify it, uh, it changes the, the, the metric. But, but that's pretty much around it, I think, is mainly awareness and having to kind of step through the application stack and the presentation data services layer to kind of make sure that everything is addressed and looked at. Thank you for those answers. I think we've run out of time, so really appreciate your taking time and sharing your knowledge and experience. Lee? Dan, uh, Shantu, and Jarrett, thank you so much for this presentation. Really, really interesting stuff. Really glad you were able to stop by and deliver this to us today. Uh, to the audience, thank you as well for sharing this information with us. Uh, this webcast was sponsored by Rackspace and presented by Virtualization Review Magazine. Thanks again, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And this does conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation.